This is what Jesus says. Matthew 8, 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus statistically talked more about hell than he did about heaven. If you look at all the verses about heaven, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven, which is exactly opposite today. You go to any... I, I was asked... Uh, Paul Dixon, Cedarville, back in, I think it was 99, asked me to come and speak at Cedarville. And so I came and speak, spoke at Cedarville, and he says, uh, you get two chapels, what are you speaking on? I said, first one heaven, second one hell. And he looked at me and he said, I, I don't know if it was 30 years, or what, he said, if you really do that, you're going to be the first chapel speaker in 30 or whatever years that have spoken on heaven and hell. I mean, they all speak on other things. He said, Wow. And so they invited me back. They said, after you speak on heaven and hell, what are you going to go on? So a few years later, I went back, and it was the most exciting Cedarville service I'd ever been in. You ever been to Cedarville? They have a huge, beautiful auditorium. There was a car accident. Someone hit the transformer. It knocked out the power. And as they introduced me, as I was walking up to speak with my Bible, all the lights went out, and the emergency lights came on. And the, the president wasn't there. The vice president was there. And he was still there introducing me. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I said, I'll still speak. I don't need microphones. I said, I, I can communicate. So I said, everybody in the back row of the balcony, if you can, and I didn't yell. I said, if you can hear me right now, wave your phone. And they all made their phones bright. And you could see the back row, their lit phones waving. And I was speaking on the seven, uh, what I talked to you about, seven marks of healthy. You remember that? You know, that are trained by grace and, you know, all that stuff reclaim boldness seven times the power came on the power went off i've never seen a group of young people paying more attention they didn't know whether you know whether i was uh, had some friend in the back that was turning the power on and off but it was so interesting to them that i never lost any of them i lose some of you i see it it's kind of you know I get a little boring, and you slip down. Some of you are really good at that, you know. In fact, I saw one of you that had your your car game going, or something. It was some video game you were playing there. But no one did that. So, okay. Hell is inutterable darkness. Imagine the person that's just entered hell. Maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's your relative, a co-worker, your friend. After the roar of physical pain blasts them, they spend the first few moments wailing and gnashing their teeth, but after a season... We all get accustomed to pain. And it's not that it's become tolerable, it's just his capacity has enlarged to comprehend and not be consumed by the pain. Though he hurts, he's now able to think. And instinctively he looks about him, but as he looks, he sees only blackness. He waits, he sees nothing but unyielding black ink. It clings to him, it smothers him, it oppresses him. And if you are interested in having your heart stirred, uh, there is this idea of what hell is like was written by uh, someone in Moody, Moody Monthly Magazine that you can find online. It's called Hell, the Horrible Doctrine of Hell or something like that. And I read that article over and over again until I could no longer think of hell lightly. Think of what Christ said. Everyone in hell believes through his earthly brother James, Christ's earthly brother James. He said, you believe there's one God, you believe you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Our sinner is not unique in hell. Because the sinner that gets there, most likely the first thing they'll say is, I believe! They think they'll get out. But the problem is, everybody in hell believes. Because they already have been resurrected. They're already stood and seen the 40 plus billion and all the throne of God and everything. And they all were guilty. But it's too late. Because God's word says there's no second chance. Hebrews 9.27 says man is destined to die one time. So there's no reincarnation. And after that, face the judgment. And that's why a while back, and I won't do it again, I told you about my friend, Andy Meekins on flight 961, that his wife said, I heard the distinct snap of his seatbelt. Because he said, if I'm, if I'm going to heaven, I'm going to take as many people with me today as I can. 
and he did. Well, our final uh, lesson has got to begin. So How it all ends, the book of Revelation, gift from God, an expositional study, part 20. What will it be like to dwell with God? That's the last two chapters. So that's how far we've gotten. We are in the seventh clear event, dwelling with God in heaven. Uh, the clear events start with us here. We're going to be raptured. We're going to answer for our lives. Our life is going to go through the conveyor belt, through the fire, and whatever doesn't burn up is what Christ gives us. Uh, while we're enjoying the wonders of heaven, the tribulation unfolds. We return wearing what we really were for Christ. All uh, of us will receive those garments. Uh, we live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. We live in heaven. So does he. He comes down. We probably will get to see the millennial earth. We watch the horrible rebellion. We stand quietly at the great white throne. And then we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So my question is, are you, gonna, are you getting ready for heaven? I know people, they get ready for cruises. They get ready for vacations. They get ready for graduation. They get ready for their wedding. Are you getting ready for heaven? I, I mean, do you think about it? Revelation 21 is about getting ready for heaven. And the real question is, are you getting ready to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Do you really believe that with all your heart? Does it change how you live? The first thing we see as we go through Revelation 21 is the difference between, oh, thank you, Colby, I just remembered this. So many of you asked me, like one of you asked, how do I witness to Roman Catholics, and well, how, do, how do you witness to Roman Catholics and everything, and so I gave Colby, he is my deputized uh, assistant here, uh, the, the QR code cards of how to find all these videos. And uh, some of you are so clever, you've already found them, but if you need, uh, our ministry site and, and all the details, Colby has a, a whole pack of them. But look at the contrast between chapter 20, verse 15, and chapter 21, verse 1. It says, uh, verse 14 of 20, death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. Remember, that's Hades, Sheol, the grave I showed you in the underworld. That's where all the dead are, everybody. Uh, and so death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. That's the waiting room that they were in. This is the second death, and if anyone's not found written in the book of life, they were cast in the lake of fire. Verse 1, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, what happened between there? Well, that's what's so interesting. The old polluted by sin universe dissolves. That's what Peter describes. See, every part of Revelation is, is connecting events that are somewhere else in the Bible. In 2 Peter 3, all lost sinners after they face their lives recorded by God and they stand there without excuse and they're sentenced to eternal death, watch what happens. The fire that melts the entire universe happens. Now, we know all about it. Revelation 21 is after it happens. There's a new heaven and a new earth. Now, there's interesting, you can look it up in your logos, a little Greek there. There are two words for new in the Greek language. There's new of a different kind and new of the same kind. Now, um, you know, if I bought a new pair of shoes, uh, for me, I would buy another pair of the same ones because I like, you know, them. Uh, but some people like new different. Both are new. Guess what heaven's going to be like? It's not new different, that Greek word. It's new the same. That means that green will still be green. You know, blue will still be blue. You understand what I mean? It's not like we're going into an alternate, you know, unusual different universe, parallel or something. You know, it's just, it's brand new, the same only now perfect without sin. How does that happen? Only Peter describes how it happens. This is what it says in 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. When the heavens pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with a fervent heat, both in the earth and the works in it will be burned up. Okay, here's a question. What did Peter mean by elements melt? Well, Peter is guided by the Holy Spirit to use the word stoichia, which means microscopic components that make up building blocks. He says, at the elemental, but below element, at the atomic and subatomic level. In other words, God uncreates the universe. That's what I told you about. He releases. He holds all things together. He just lets it all release. And when you release the power inside the atom, there's this 
massive, remember, energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. That was Einstein's famous equation. That's, a, that's an amazing amount of energy. God tells us he's going to refine the universe with fire right down to the very essence of matter. It's all going to be consumed. But here's the lesson I wrote in my journal. Everything unconnected to God burns. It says in 1 John 2.17, the world is passing away. The universe, the earth, all the systems, the social, the economic, the cultural, everything is consumed. And Peter asks us something. And, and this is one in 1 Peter 3.11, I mean 2 Peter 3.11. It says 1 Peter, but it's wrong. Uh, that is a typo. It's 2 Peter 3.11. Look what Peter said. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. I think that's almost the application of the whole course on Revelation. Isn't Peter great? He said, Paul's hard to understand, but I'll get to the point. If you really believe all this, that we've been studying for 19 and a half hours, how should you live if you really believe this? Wow. These words may be the most important words that really wrap your mind around if you believe God, if you know Jesus, if you want to please him with your life. He wants us to be holy in our conduct and godliness. That's what grace teaches us. The grace of God that brings salvation, Titus 2, 11 to 13, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly and be zealous as his servants. So my question is, are you excited to taste the joys of heaven? You know what's so interesting? People say heaven sounds wonderful with Jesus and everything, but let's hold off, you know? One of the things I hear most often in the 300 plus weddings I've performed is couples would say, you don't think the Lord's going to come back before we get married, do you? I sensed a little hesitance. They didn't want to go to heaven yet. They thought marriage was better. They thought, you know, whatever. They, they just didn't want to miss something on earth. Any joy you've ever experienced on earth will be infinitely better in heaven. It's amazing. But that's how we become. It's usually not until people are approaching the end of their life that they, their thoughts go back to can't wait to get to heaven. When they get painful, when they, you know what I tell people about my age? I'm at the age where half of everything that I was born with doesn't work anymore and the half that I still have hurts. Okay? That's what old age is like. Read Ecclesiastes 12. That's what happens. But if we're honest, most of us would say we're hoping for heaven, but just not quite yet. And I think the reason for that is we haven't thought about what we're going toward. So here's a little picture of someone's funeral. What will your last moment on earth be like? And now I challenge, and, and uh, how much time do we have here? Not very much time. I challenge uh, groups all the time. I mean, I, I just was down at Word of Life Florida in February uh, talking to their seniors, and uh, there are hundreds of them, and they're down there. They, they're always giving to help in the ministry. They're wonderful. They live in trailers all around the Word of Life Florida, and some of you, or some of them, I think, are coming up here soon. Uh, and I mean of the students from down there, but these seniors, I said, you know what? You're coming to a time when they're going to take everything away from you. When you go into the hospital, when you get something, either your heart or your lungs or COVID or something, what they do is they, they give you one of those little horrible gowns that doesn't close in the back, you know, and you're cold, and they take everything away. They take your rings away. They take your watch away in the hospital. If you've ever checked in someone you love, they give you a little plastic bag and they strip them of their hearing aids and they even take your glasses uh, if you're really sick, and then they start intubating you. Even the word sounds painful. It is. I mean, they start, they've got that one in there, and they've got this one in here. They have one going up the nose. They have them in all kinds of places, and it's just awful. And you're laying in that little bed, and they always have the air conditioning on, and, and you're up all the time because either they're your arm, or they're taking blood, and they put that big port in to take your blood, and then they've got the peeping, blinking machines. Can you tell? I've been in the hospital, and it's awful. And do you know what you find, especially if you have a lot of tubes? You're immobilized by that. You can't do anything. You're at their mercy. They feed you. Uh, they, they cart you to the bathroom if you're mobile enough. They do everything. And I looked at the group, and I said, what what treasure of the living and abiding Word of God 
When you find it, it gives joy to your heart. Remember what Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found and I did eat them. And thy words were to me the joy and rejoicing in my heart because I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 15, 16. You should memorize that one. What part of that are you going to have so that you can get an injection from God of joy and rejoicing? You're only going to have the ones you've memorized and meditate on and you have them there. There's coming a day when they're taking every single thing from your wedding ring to your Apple Watch and your Apple phone or your Galaxy or whatever you have, they're going to take it away from you. And what you're going to be left with as you head to death is what you have hidden, written in your heart. Don't memorize the verses to get five points on the final or ten. I don't know how much it is. Memorize them because they're the most precious commodity you at any moment, night or day, can hear God talking to you when you meditate on the Word of God. It's Him talking to you right there. And you can even pick all your favorites, just like people make their playlists. Why don't you look as intently on verses as you do on your playlists and everything else that we spend our time with? Okay, what happens the moment we die? Well, if we memorize Scripture, it says in Psalm 23, 4, a parallel with Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 says, it's appointed unto man once to die. The important word appointed. All of us have an appointment with death. All of us. Uh, if we don't have an appointment with death, it's only because in a moment, in the twinkle of the eye, he's going to call us. But most of us, unless Christ returns soon, have an appointment with death. What happens in that moment? Psalm 23, 4 tells us, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For what? What does it say in Psalm 23? For what? Why do I not fear? Who? Thou. That's the old English. Who is the thou in Psalm 23? Who is David talking about? Who's the good shepherd? Who introduced himself in John chapter 10? Said, I'm the good shepherd from the book of Psalms. Yeah, Jesus. So get, here's the news. Every one of us who are Christians have an appointment for death, and before death comes, someone comes to get us to walk us through the valley of death's shadow. Here, I'm going to read to you. I love doing funerals. One of my dear friends, he was a legislator in uh, Oklahoma's uh, um, legislature. He died young, unexpectedly. I had performed his wedding and dedicated all of his kids and baptized him, baptized his wife, dedicated his kids. And so his wife called us and and we flew back, and this is what I wrote. Jesus visited, and I named the hospital room he died in, to meet another of his precious children. Just as the dark, cold river of death began to flow, and the valley of death's shadow began to creak open, the, one who, the only one who ever defeated death and destroyed him who had the power of death extended his arms toward David. It was 5.45 a.m. in the hospital, and all of a sudden... David was acutely aware of hearing a voice. You know, he was totally, I mean, he was on respirator, life support, everything. And with all that hissing and everything, he heard a voice. And in his mind, as he listened, he realized it was a voice he knew so well. And it's because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So at the voice of his good shepherd, David looked up on Sunday morning for what would become the greatest day of his life. David heard the voice of Jesus coming to take him to heaven. David saw Jesus standing there, the one who had been crushed for his iniquities. Then he looked at his face, and it was the one who was bruised for his transgressions. And then he saw those hands that were extended to him, and they were pierced for his sins. Those nail-scarred hands reached out for his. So David reached up. And when his family only saw that his tired, worn-out body had fallen silent with all the tubes coming out of it, David had already firmly grasped the hands of Jesus. He slipped quietly out of bed. He headed with Jesus to the place he had been preparing for him, and now it was ready. <laughs> you ever thought about that? I hear all the time, people have an untimely death. Yeah, that's a very human way of putting it. But Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that you can be with me in that place I've prepared for you. Death for us is a personal, private rapture. I, I remember being at the bedside of another one. He was a dear, godly, 
saint. He had founded the church I was pastoring. He had founded the camp that I had ministered at. He was a giant of the faith. But in his house, under hospice care, he was really struggling. And finally, when no one was around, not even his wife, he said to me, I'm really troubled, pastor. He called me pastor, and he was, he was a giant, but I was his pastor as he was dying. And I said, well, what's the problem, Willard? He said, I thought I was going in the rapture. I lived my whole life telling everybody to wait for the rapture, and I've been waiting, and he said, I am, I'm actually upset and disappointed. Now, he didn't talk like that because he had all the gear on, but he pulled it aside and was wheezing and gasping for breath and said, I'm, I'm really disappointed. I said, of what? He said, I'm missing the rapture. I said, you are not. There are two raptures. Now, here's this giant Bible expositor. I mean, giant of the faith. And he went, he had strength. He was defending the faith. He said, there are not two raptures. I said, yes, there are. Psalm 23 Verse 4 says there's a private, personal one where the Lord Jesus comes just for you and takes you to the place he prepared that he promised in John 14. Then there's the group event where everybody's involved. I said, which do you think is more special, the big group event or when he comes just for you? Boy, that oxygen mask went right back on. A little smile came to his face. He said, I never thought of that before. He said, I get a personal rapture. I said, you are. He died about an hour later. And when I did his funeral, I said, you know, I was talking with Willard, and I know exactly where Jesus Christ was last night at 9, 12 p.m. He was standing next to Willard's bed. Well, after he stands at Willard's bed or David's bed, as we learned already in Revelation 3, 5, we get to heaven led by the nail-scarred hand of Jesus to meet our Heavenly Father because Jesus paid it all. Our highest delight. We gather before God. Listen to what happens according to Revelation 3.5. You remember Revelation 3.5? That was last week. This is what it said. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So, back to the funeral. By the way, this is actually, these words I'm reading are what I read at funerals. You know, people, it's interesting, at the end of a funeral, and I've done hundreds of them, a lot of them come up and they'll say, you know, I came here for David's funeral, but you know what? You probably don't even know this, but what you said about David really made me think about myself. I thought, yeah, well, David's gone. He, he's already enjoying this. I really was targeting toward you, you know? If you, those of you that you were in homiletics or something class in here before I got here, if you really are going to teach the Bible, one of the most effective ways to teach the Bible is to do an aside. You don't point at people and say you and point right in their eye and say you. What you say is, you know, I have a friend. And you turn and start talking about this friend, 99% of all the people out there will relate to that friend, but not if you point right at them and say it's them. See, and so you do that at a funeral. So what I say at the funeral is this. Listen for a moment. Because just before 6 a.m., David was taken by the hand as the Lord Jesus himself led him past the marshaled ranks of angels. He led him up what we read about the golden streets of heaven, past the cherubim and seraphim, up, up, up to the very throne of God himself. And then David heard the Lord Jesus call him by a name that no one else knew, his new name. And he was presented in person with that unique identity that no one else has to God as his beloved child. Then he heard the father say, bring the best robe and put it on him. Think of it. A robe of white, bright as the day, pure as the light. When the Lord Jesus was transfigured in the mount, something happened not only to his countenance, something happened to his clothes, and his raiment became white as the light. What a reward for all of us who have been completely forgiven to have a robe like that draped around our shoulders and invited to walk with Jesus in heaven. So think about your first moment in heaven. Discover the blessings of being married to Jesus. I, I put in your notes that someday you'll get. I think they've scheduled to give you the slides of this class in September, but whenever you get them, this is in there. 
And, and Harry Rimmer wrote his own funeral, and you can read that. It's a beautiful, um, wonderful piece. But now before we go, I want to talk about heaven. I'm going to talk about seven wonders of heaven, okay? Because I want you to think about what it means to live with God, okay? Number one, we get to live with our creator. Look at Isaiah 46. Um, and, and any of you that are going into ministry, men and women, because we're all in the ministry, but if you're going to minister to people, it's really good to have this passage underlined because you're going to visit someone in the hospital. And this is one of those passages that's my go-to when it's a believer in the hospital. When it's an unbeliever, I try and make it so that they want it, but for a believer, it's really powerful. This is what the Lord says in verse 4. Well, verse 3. Uh, you have been upheld for me from birth. You have been carried from the womb. Verse 4. Even to your old age, I am he. Even to your gray hairs, I will carry you. I made you. I will bear you. Even I will carry you. And I will deliver you. What we need is to be stirred up by way of reminder. That's what Peter said. I, I'm writing this to you to stir you up by way of reminder. Peter repeated himself. That's just how he was. Peter just was a repeater. And you probably heard, if you hear older preachers, they just say the same things over and over again. And I probably have said the same thing, I don't know how many times, to you. But this one bears repeating. We need to be stirred up by way of remembrance that there's only one person that was there Think of all these points. At the instant of your conception within your mother's womb, when your mother and father were together, they were there 40 weeks later when the doctor or the midwife or whoever delivered you. They were there, and the Bible says that at conception, they designed you, and also, Psalm 139 says, they wrote down every day of your life, your appointment for death was already set at the instant of your beginning to be alive at conception, they caught you and were there carrying you, Isaiah 46 says. They've carried you all the way through life. When your parents are no longer here on earth, they're still carrying you. When the doctor that delivered you is long gone, they're still carrying you. When you get gray-haired and old and unable to go on, they're still carrying you. And when they're whispering about you in the hospital behind your back and telling your children and grandchildren that you don't have long, you should go in and talk to him. And you can still hear well enough that you hear that, he's still carrying you. See, our creator has carried us from birth. And he's going to carry us until he carries us home. He's our guardian. He never sleeps. It says in the Psalms, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers or sleeps. In Romans 8, 28, do you know what the actual order of the Greek is? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. It's not vague. It's not all things work together for good somehow. We're not sure how. The order of the words, it's God who is orchestrating everything to work together for good. He's also our designer. Psalm 139 says that he who invented DNA, they just found out three weeks ago that, I think I mentioned this, but it's still wonderful. DNA has a ER kind of ambulance mechanism that when there's any, like uh, when sun starts uh, affecting the DNA and it starts mutating and you're gonna get skin cancer, instantly there's this DNA kind of uh, ambulance that comes and it clamps off both sides of the DNA strand so that that will not go beyond that little section that starts trying to repair it. Unbelievable. The scientists probably going to get a Nobel Prize for that. But guess what it's going to do? It's going to ruin all their theories of evolution. How do you evolve a mechanism of self-repair when each iteration is dying because it's imperfect and it needs to get better? Why didn't it just... Oh, it did just start with that. Because it didn't evolve. Our designer designed it. And, and he's our friend. Do you remember my story about Carl and the, the aquarium? Do you know what he said to David? David was assured of what God had promised, so he looked at the Lord and he said, you're going to show me the path of life. You're going to be my, my, my lifelong guide. If I stay close to you, kind of like a cell tower, as long as I'm near you, I'll have fullness of joy. And if I do what you tell me to do, I stay at your right hand, 
I'll have endless pleasures. Boy, that answers life. I mean, that's, those are the first four wonders of heaven that we're going to be with our Creator. Wow. Who created us in His image. Wow. You know, everybody goes through life trying to look like someone, act like someone, be like someone. That's the biggest thing in our culture now. Everybody wants to be someone else. You know, they want to be like whoever they idolize. God says, why don't you idolize me? Why don't I become the one you want to be like? I made you in my image. Why don't you say I want to look more and more and more like you want me to look? Because I'm in your image. I want to look like you. Do you know how we do that? It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed into his image. What is that? It's talking about the Bible. The Bible is the mirror. When we look in the mirror, we see what God wants and we see ourselves reflected and we see where we're not quite what he wants. And we ask him to change us. So that one, our creator, our guardian, our designer, our friend, said, I want to take you through life. Let me just tell you a little bit about what heaven's going to be like. Your best friend who's designing heaven for you right now designed all the life that's in one drop of water. There's a microscopic view of one drop of water. Let me read to you from a science book. They didn't, I added these words. God has demonstrated an unbelievable ability to cause life here on this planet to flourish beyond what we can even comprehend. Here is an example from nature. To see the explosive power of life in this world, look at any standing water or pond, okay? It's spring thaw, water's standing all over the place. As soon as it warms up, look at one drop of water. Water is preeminently the seat of life. There is not a bay or a creek or a shelf or a sound on the face of the earth that doesn't teem with life. Every drop of ditch water can hold 500 million microscopic creatures. One drop, 500 million. They are so small that one teaspoonful of water would be to them as the Atlantic Ocean is to us. So there, you can kind of see the... the, difference. Those half a billion infusoria can live comfortably their entire existence in that drop of water. They appear in over 1,000 species in one drop of water. A thousand different, so far they've found, species. Some are herbivores. Some are carnivores. Some have shells. Some have none. Some have mouths, teeth, muscles, nerves, and glands. Some have between one and 200 sacs or stomachs that are connected by an intestinal canal. The thickness of the membrane in one infusoria that line their stomachs is one fifty millionth part of an inch. God engineered on the microscopic level Something that even nanotechnology cannot... I mean, they can line wafers and make nanochips. They cannot manufacture membranes of a living organism that can digest. I mean, this is nothing to God. Only a God who is infinite could have worked such a majestic scale as we see either looking out in the skies in the universe or on the microscopic scale in any water. There's no such thing as bigness and smallness to God. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, the same complexity you see in a quasar or a, uh, some galaxy or some, no, you know, whatever's out there, a uh, nebula, the same beauty and complexity and unbelievable engineering you find in a drop of ditch water. See, God lavishes his power, and it doesn't matter if it's big or small. Do you know, that's why we need to be released from this idea that we can only be important if we have something big that becomes viral and a hit. How many people knew about the widow who had the, the, the leptons, the mites, between her fingers that looked all around at the temple and Jesus was sitting way over, it even tells us in the Gospels, he was sitting way over out of you know, her sight and it says she came up to the offering thing, made sure no one was around, and no one could see what she had because a lepton is, is actually, the, they call them onion skins. If you ever peel onions, you know the brown covered outer skin is so thin. They were that thin. And she was holding two of them, which was her entire asset. 
total of her assets, Jesus tells us, and she put them in with love and adoration into the receptacle. They probably got stuck in a crack. They were so little. And Jesus said everybody before him was bringing up wheelbarrows of gold and silver and blowing horns and marching up, you know, with everybody watching and everybody was taken up and they were clinking all that treasure into the receptacles. And while they were all distracted, she knew no one would look. She put hers in over here. And you know what Jesus said? She put in more than everybody else. See, with God, bigness is the heart. The motivation, how much love there is. Well, those are the only first four wonders of heaven. The last three are, he's our completer. I already quoted Jeremiah 15, 16. God says, I want to give you joy and rejoicing. I want you to go through life so you're like our waiter at the pantry at Ninth and Figueroa I told you about, who leaned down and looked at us and said, what drug are you on? It's better than mine. We're supposed to be so completed by Christ that we're satisfied, we're filled with joy. It isn't human, it's divine. We're filled with delights, we're filled with the thrill that the one who caused us to begin life at conception, designed us then, carried us from birth, carries us through life, carries us till our last breath, and never lets go, takes us home. Wow. He's also the changeless one. He made the laws of nature. He keeps his word. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is the almighty God. Remember I told you that Birmingham or whatever university was mapping the sky and every time they took a square and looked at it, everything they thought was a star, was a galaxy. What they thought were galaxies were clusters of galaxies and it just goes on and on and on. That God says... I am your father. And uh, I mean, if you think the universe is beautiful, just think of heaven. By the way, heaven is a permanent place. It says in chapter 21, uh, it starts introducing it, but it reminds us of Hebrews 11:10. Remember, the heroes of the faith, Abraham and all the others, waited for a city that had foundations. Remember, Abraham, once he got saved, he left his house in Ur, and he never, he never built another building he only built altars, and he never bought another piece of property once he became God's friend, except for a gravesite for his wife. The rest of the time, he lived in a tent. He said, I'm a pilgrim and stranger, and I'm going to just go wherever God tells me to go. Wow. But look at this. God always uses vivid, artistic imagery when portraying heaven. His images, the textures, the brilliance, the light, jewels, all that stuff, Here's a little picture of what heaven will be like. Did you know when you read Revelation 21, 19 to 21, the 12 stones that are mentioned parallel the, the high priest. The, the high priest of Israel used to wear this plate right here that looked like that. And we know the colors of those stones. And those are the colors of heaven. Well, obviously, the early believers thought much about heaven. Uh, I, I told you this. I'll read it to you now. Graham Scroggie a great British Bible teacher, said this, not without reason did the early church study this book. Practically the whole of it is reproducible from the Christian writers. Remember I told you they took the sermons that are extant, that are still in existence of the, of the post-apostolic church fathers, post after the apostles, so those that were of the second century after the first century. If you look at their sermons, the ones that we have, you can almost get an entire 404 verses quoted in those sermons the whole book of Revelation. They didn't just do 1, 2, and 3, or 4 and 5, or 21 and 22. They even did all that other stuff. It's amazing. It, it was important to them. They thought much about heaven. Revelation 21, 16. Oh, this one you have to see. It says uh, in Revelation 21, oh, nine minutes, 16. And the city was laid out in a square. Its length was as great as its breadth, and it measured the city with a reed 12,000 furlongs long. Its length and breadth and height, they're all equal. And he measured it. So if you get to that chapter, guess what I found in that chapter? I wrote this for verse 16. Living forever in the Holy of Holies. Did you know there's one place described in the Bible that's exactly a cube? 
and it's in Exodus. And it gives all the measurements. There's the holy place, you know, where the altar of incense and where the seven branch menorah and where the table of the showbread are. But they're in this outer area, the holy place. But inside, there was a perfect cube. And that's where God was hovering the Shekinah glory over the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Heaven is a 1,400 mile in each direction cube. It's shaped just like the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. Every gate, look at verse 22. It says 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was a pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Each gate is a single 1,500 mile high pearl. Well, I mean, if the wall is 1,400 miles high, the gate probably extends above. Maybe it's only 1,300 miles. I don't know, but it's a pearl. And just as pearls were formed through the injury of the oyster, we're reminded forever when we go into heaven, we're only going in there because someone was wounded and crushed and bruised for us. That's why they're all pearls. See, everything is intentional in the Bible. And, and God wants us to know how important all these details are for our lives. We'll drink the water of life flowing from underneath the throne. It will supply us everlasting life. Because remember, we're not self-sufficient even in heaven. We need to be kept alive by God. Do you remember when Moses was on the Mount of Sinai? Do you remember what happened to him? He was up there 40 days. What happened after 40 days? He absorbed some of the radiation. Do you remember that? He glowed, he scared everybody. He came down glowing in the dark. I mean, it was like one of those luminescent flashlights. He had to cover up his face. It scared everybody because he had been with God. See, God is life, and it flows out of him, and it flows into everything around him, and God gives us all what we really want. Well, chapter 22, and I just have a couple of verses I'm going to show you. The first one is, worship or submission to God is central to all the Bible. Look at verse 9. You can read all the rest. We're supposed to. It's worth a lot of points. But look what he says. Then he said to me, verse 9, see that you do not do that. See, John was overwhelmed at the angel. The angel was so <sighs> unbelievably, he started worshiping the angel. He said, don't do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Well, that's the central theme of the scriptures. Worship God. Worship of God is the mark of true believers. Here's my second observation from verse 22. When we take the final trip with Jesus through the valley of shadow of death or in the skies through the clouds at the voice of the archangel, no baggage left here can accompany us. Uh, look what it says in 22.12. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is already with me to give to everyone according to his work. In other words, anything that matters, you have to send ahead. You can't take with you. Now, we can unusually take people with us to heaven. It says that in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. Paul said, what is my hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It's you in the presence of the Lord. So anybody you lead to the Lord, you actually kind of take with you because the Lord kind of associates us with who we lead to Christ. But nothing else physical can you take. Immortal souls you can, except what you send ahead. So I wrote, only what we send ahead here will make it to heaven. And what keeps us from getting to heaven is a lust for comfort and convenience, if we're lusting for comfort and convenience, we spend all of our life guarding all this stuff and we don't want anybody to take it. Remember what Ecclesiastes said, the more you have, the more you want. The more you have, the more everybody else wants it. The more you have, the harder it is to give it up. I mean, all those principles are in Ecclesiastes. God says, no, don't lust for comfort and convenience. Long for your heavenly home. Don't be greedy for recognition. Remember Jesus said, if you get clapped for what you did and sacrificed the Lord, you don't have any reward in heaven. Wow. We have people that want their name attached, their gift. You know, they donate, but they want their name. They want to be named on the building or whatever. That's okay. It's good. You have a reward. We think you're great. But you lose that reward in heaven, Jesus said, when we want to be recognized. And that's something. You want what you do for the Lord to last forever? Make sure that you're not your biggest self-promoter and a covetousness for security that keeps us. We need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Uh, when the Bible closes in Revelation 22, we're transported to the fringes of eternity. We step out into the garden of God. It's called the final paradise. For just a minute, have you ever thought about the first paradise? 
Imagine what it was like at the dawn of creation. Think about life as a perfect human. Your first memory as Adam and Eve would have been waking up in God's garden, Eden. You're in a comfortable world, no extremes. You're surrounded by the beauty and the fragrance. You have no pains, no sorrows, no fears, no weariness. That's what we go back to. On our way there, we have to stand in front of Jesus and say, did I live my life for you or did I just waste it? Let's see, do I have my keys here? I think I gave them to Bonnie. I don't know what I did with my keys. I usually keep them in my pocket, but this is what I usually do in the class, and I've done this for generations of you young people. I say, when Bonnie and I are driving across the country, we drive a lot when we're in the States, and we even drive a lot when we're not in the States, but when we drive the car, Bonnie will say, hey, do you want me to drive? I say, "Uh uh-huh. She knows I'm serious. When I pull over the car to the side, I put it in gear, I turn it off, I pull the keys out, I come around to the other side of the car, I open her door, and I hand her the keys. And I get out of the driver's seat, and I get into the, the passenger seat, and she has total control, the keys, the steering wheel, everything, and I don't. Who's the driver of your life? Did you know every morning the Lord wants you to pull over, hand him the keys, get in the passenger seat, and let him drive? That's surrender. So Bonnie and I say, that's it. Thanks for listening. Pray for us. You can friend us on Facebook. I don't think young people your age use Facebook anymore. And I'm too old to be on Instagram. You can subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You always know where I am because wherever I'm teaching, it gets posted on YouTube. And, and it's called DTBM. Stay in touch. We have been teaching in these Bible institutes. In fact, the first time I taught here was in 1987. The first time. So that was 13, 35 years ago. That's generations of young people. And we teach in them all over the world. Stay in touch because we love to hear what God's going to do with your life. And Revelation reminds us of how it all ends and what it's going to be like to dwell with God forever. God bless you. We're done a minute early.